The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, genocide in China. One of the worst human rights crises of our time. Uyghurs forced into concentration camps. Christians forced to worship the state. It is truly the stain of the century. Then, a doctor's warning. You need to go to the emergency room. Abort or die. The baby couldn't get through the tube. Why this pregnant mom chose option three. I'm not going to kill the baby because it's a promise from God and I'm not going to kill it. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. International outrage is accelerating against China. First, Beijing botched the handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Now that government is in the midst of a brutal crackdown against Christians. So horrific, it's being called the stain of the century. And that's not all against the Muslim Uyghurs. Forced sterilization and genocide are underway. That's today's China. Gary Lane brings us this report. July 22nd, 2020, a loud knock on the door at the home of a woman in China's Yemen city. She tells the police outside they cannot enter her home without a permit. Moments later, they destroy the lock and enter anyway, breaking up what the government says is an illegal meeting. Four days later, Sunday, July 26th, government workers remove the cross from the roof of Small River Christian Church in Xinfin County, Jiangxi Province. These are just two recent examples, both incidents occurring just days ago in the Chinese Communist Party's crackdown on Christians and their churches. China aide President Bob Fu says this wave of persecution actually began in 2015. But now the Chinese Communist Party has a new excuse for targeting Christians. Now, under this the pretext of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, um, the Chinese Communist Party has intensified its persecution by banning all the church activities, even those services or worship uh, or prayer meetings in believers' own homes uh, with their own family members. The government is also using this as an excuse to arrest Christians who call for online prayer meetings. CBN has reported on the removal of crosses from church buildings, and this month it picked up steam. In addition to the Small River Church cross removal, on July 7th, more than 100 Public Security Bureau police and others were sent to oversee the demolition of crosses at Aoti Christian Church and Yangchang Christian Church in China's Zhejiang province. Security guards reportedly beat Christians who tried to stop the cross removals. Church members saying those injured included a man in his 80s, violently pushed to the ground. And on July 5th, police interrupted services at Guilin in Guang Church, arresting church elders. Hours later, church members sang hymns outside the Seven Star Public Security Bureau station as they awaited the release of their leaders. Fu says it's all a part of a new campaign of sinicization, which means Christians are only considered to be good citizens if they adhere to communist ideology. And ironically, Xi Jinping's portrait was even put on the church pulpit along with the Chairman Mao. And uh, the first line item of worship, um, uh, you know, by the government sanctioned church before COVID-19 uh, was to sing a Communist Party's national anthem. And examples go beyond churches. In Fuzhou City, a Catholic family was forced out of their government-subsidized housing after they refused to remove religious icons from their home. And China's Religious Affairs Bureau has banned religious funeral ceremonies and preaching in funeral places. Meanwhile, Christians aren't the only ones suffering. Ethnic Uyghurs from East Turkestan, a region the communist government calls Xinjiang province, are under attack. China is home to one of the worst human rights crises of our time. It is truly the stain of the century. The U.S. Council on International Religious Freedom goes further, calling it genocide. 
For years, the Chinese government has forced Uyghur women to undergo abortions. Now, a new development. The president of East Turkestan's government in exile told me on the Global Lane that China is also conducting forced sterilization. Hundreds of thousands of Uyghur and other Turkic uh, women have been forcibly sterilized by the uh, Chinese government. China has a long-standing policy of uh, forcibly aborting uh, Uyghur and other Turkic babies. In fact, according to the Chinese government, between 1979 and 2009, they prevented uh, 3.7 million illegal births uh, in East Turkestan. Also, Hudayar and the U.S. Defense Department say as many as 3 million Uyghurs are being forcibly detained in re-education and forced labor camps. Beijing described Xinjiang's internment camps as vocational training camps. New reports of forced abortions and sterilizations add to a body of evidence that contradicts that. The U.S. State Department is alerting corporate CEOs and others about China's use of Uyghur slave labor so they won't become involved. The East Turkestan government in exile is taking its case to the International Criminal Court. But whether it is the persecution of Uyghurs or Christians, China's communist government is likely to ignore international outrage, describing it as foreign interference in Chinese internal affairs. Gary Lane, CBN News. You know, ladies and gentlemen, some years ago, I w went to China before much of this stuff had happened. I was out on the streets and I preached and people were so open to the gospel. I, I later went and preached on a Sunday at a three-self church that was filled with people worshiping Jesus. And it looked to me like China was fast becoming the largest Christian nation on the face of the earth. What's happened with this uh, Xi is just horrible. and. Uh, People can come into the home of a, of a couple, and if they don't find pictures of uh, Mao Zedong or uh, one of the or Marx or Lenin or one of those communist leaders, uh, the, the, these people can be stripped of their of their livelihood, profit, pr permitted, I mean, prohibited against working. It's a horrible thing. Now we're supposed to pray for our leaders. Okay, that's what the Bible says. I would that your prayers be made for those in authority. But there's nothing in the Bible that says we can't pray that God will take down leaders of oppressive regimes that belong to somebody else. And I think we ought to be praying as hard as we can that God will take the president of China and the, those awful people out of office. And I think that he can do it. We don't have to ask some international court to do it, I think we can appeal to the court of heaven. And I think in your prayer time, and we just declare it in the name of Jesus, that this persecution against God's people in China will stop. Because the Chinese, way back in history, in their, their kanjis, in their writings, they show an, a knowledge of the Old Testament. They, it was a country that was given to God Almighty. And they are wonderful people. And I think the current wave of Chinese leadership is an abomination on the face of the earth, and something needs to be done. And I think let us all appeal to the court of heaven to say, take down these wicked leaders and set the Chinese people free. Terry. Up next, we have more of today's top headlines from the CBN newsroom. And then later on, abort the pregnancy or you could die. One woman defies her doctor's orders. See the supernatural promise that led to a miracle. Welcome back to the 700 Club from our news bureau here in Washington. The coronavirus lockdowns took a heavy toll on the economy in the second quarter. The government's first estimate today shows the economy contracted by nearly 33 percent, 32.9, from April through June. That's by far the worst on record for a single quarter. And the damage isn't over yet as another 1.4 million Americans filed new jobless claims in the last week. Today's numbers come as lawmakers here in Washington struggle to come up with another stimulus plan to help unemployed Americans and as the Federal Reserve announces its latest move to help the economy. Jenna Browner reports. The latest numbers come after Fed Chair Jerome Powell's announcement. The virus is putting a drag on the economy. And for now, that means continued low interest rates 
and debt buyback. The path forward for the economy is extraordinarily uncertain and will depend in large part on our success in keeping the virus in check. That and he says finding a successful treatment or vaccine. Indeed, we have seen some signs in recent weeks that the increase in virus cases and the renewed measures to control it are starting to weigh on economic activity. This as Democrats and Republicans struggle to reach an agreement over another stimulus plan. At the heart of the issue is a $600 a week unemployment benefit set to expire in just a few days. That's $600 plus normal unemployment benefits. Democrats want to keep the program going. Republicans would like to cut it back. Economist Stephen Moore Wednesday on CBN's Faith Nation. Do you think we'll see a relief deal from lawmakers to expand that aid? Well, that aid has had a lot of harmful effects. I, I estimate we probably have about one or two million more Americans working today were it not for the fact that workers are getting, unemployed workers are getting, in some cases, twice as much money for not working as working. I mean, that, that's not just bad economic policy. It's just not fair to the people in this country who are working to have somebody next door, you know, getting more money who's staying at home sitting on the couch. One encouraging sign, the company Eastman Kodak has been given a major grant to begin helping manufacture pharmaceuticals. Meanwhile, the economy taking center stage on the election campaign. In Midland, Texas, the heart of American energy production, President Trump blasted Democrats and his opponent Joe Biden for their green energy plan. Their platform calls for mandating zero carbon emissions from power plants by 2035. In other words, no drilling, no fracking, no coal, no shale, no gas, no oil. Otherwise, they've been very good to the industry, I think. Biden also taking a swing at the president over the economy. He's shown that he can't beat the pandemic and keep you safe. He can't turn the economy around and get America back to work. The Fed and others like Steve Moore agree the economy won't make a full recovery until we have the upper hand on a successful virus treatment or vaccine. The solution at this point probably is not with the Fed. Uh, as they said today, the most important thing is to get the caseloads down and the deaths down from coronavirus. And health officials say they're optimistic we'll see a vaccine by the end of 2020. Right now, 24 vaccines are in the human testing phase. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. And on the topic of the coronavirus, a sad milestone in the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 150,000 Americans have now died from the virus. The number of deaths jumping 30 percent in the last week as the Department of Homeland Security identified nearly 100 hotspots in 30 states. Meanwhile, Texas Congressman Louis Gohmert has contracted the virus, learning the news from a White House test taken before scheduled trip on Air Force One with the president. The news prompting House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to require lawmakers and their staff, Pat, to wear masks on the House floor and also in office buildings. Well, I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, that we really, you know, it isn't acting uh, like I've got a lot of faith I'm going to be spared. I think if we love each other and we want to act in love, we will wear masks. We will not go out in public and run the risk of either getting it ourselves or giving it to somebody else. Now, this isn't just a little disease of the lungs. They have found that people who have this COVID have lesions in their heart. There is all kinds of, uh, uh, there are all kinds of associated uh, problems with this disease. And we're not sure what it does to people's brains, what the, their cognitive abilities, and all the way down the line. So we don't want to get it. It's not a question of I can get a, a, a medicine to help me through once I've gotten it. You don't want to get it. And so whatever you do, listen to the guidelines. Stay away from people as much as you can and wear a mask and wash your hands and do all the things they suggest. Again, if you love people, you know, this is a sign of love. You don't want your family members to get it. We, we had a little piece yesterday about uh, the Westminster Canterbury, and that's a senior citizen's uh, place that they have in, in uh, Virginia Beach that's just exceptionally well run. And they put a lockdown on. They said nobody comes into this facility to visit anybody. It doesn't matter what relationship it is, you cannot come in. And they haven't had, had one single case of COVID. So it does, it's a terrible virus. It, it is airborne. We, we don't yet know all the ramifications. 
we're praying for a, a, a vaccine, which I think, the, you know, there's several in the works right now. Pfizer, for example, got a billion dollars or something they think is successful. And we, we want it to work. But until it works, do what they suggest it is good for us all. John? Important reminders, Pat. With millions of Americans losing their jobs and their health insurance, many are reconsidering who should pay the bill if they get sick. As Jennifer Wishon explains, the answer just might give momentum to Democratic calls for Medicare for all. The coronavirus pandemic sweeping the world is changing attitudes about adopting a socialist model for health care coverage here in America. A recent survey by one poll shows more than 75% of Americans say now is the time to experiment with universal health care. 76% think those who catch COVID-19 should get free treatment. And it's not just Democratic socialists who feel the burn. 74% of Republicans and 84% of Democrats polled agree universal health care is needed in response to the pandemic. Michael Cannon with the Cato Institute says while this growing support of universal health care isn't surprising, the question remains, how do you do it? Even though a lot of people associate government funding or government control with universal health care, government doesn't make health care more universal. It makes health care less universal. He adds, just look at the handling of the pandemic. Initially, the FDA blocked the approval of tests. Then state and local regulations made it hard for some clinicians to test or treat patients. And laws that mandate Americans lose their health insurance when they lose their jobs left millions stranded without coverage. Insurance professional Den Bishop wrote The Voter's Guide to Healthcare, a nonpartisan, candid, and relevant look at politics and healthcare in America. He says Senator Bernie Sanders was smart to brand his program Medicare for All. If you as a politician um, want to get yourself kicked out of office, you just talk about cutting Medicare. <laughs> it is a very popular program. But if every American had Medicare, it would crash the system. Hospital capacity would nosedive. That's because hospitals lose 10% on Medicare coverage. Private insurance pays 241% of what Medicare pays for the exact same services, making it possible for hospitals to stay afloat and make money. Bishop also points to Obamacare as an example. More people have health care because of the program, but it costs taxpayers $10,000 per person per year for a total of $737 billion in 2019. It did provide additional protections. It did provide additional coverage. Those are a good thing, but it did it in a very financially inefficient way. The one poll also found 65% of Americans fear the financial burden they'll face if they get infected, likely a symptom of health care costs growing faster than wages. Americans don't have the savings cushion to fall back on because government has been taxing them uh, to, to fund all sorts of things, including uh, uh, health care programs that drive up the cost of health care. And Bishop says studies show nearly 100 million Americans are underinsured. If we lose sensitivity to that, then I believe the government will take over all of health care and we'll have to deal with the ramifications of, of that system. There's no question health care will be a top issue as voters elect a president this fall. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Revamping health care in the wake of coronavirus. Pat, back to you. Well, if you want to see how government-led health care works, go to England and ask those people what they think of government um, uh, rationed health care. Uh, they can't get into hospitals. They can't have emergency surgery. Uh, they have to wait in line, and many people are dying. Uh, go to the Veterans Administration and see how they fell up on the veterans. You don't want government running your health care. It just doesn't work. They're inefficient, and it is enormously costly. And the idea of Medicare for all, where the government pays for everything, is just an illusion. It shouldn't be done. But uh, w it's like the Pied Piper, the siren call of, uh, of something for nothing. And young people are very susceptible to that. Well, the government's going to pay for it. Well, that's just great. Well, where's the government will get the money? Well, we don't have to worry about that. That's not our money. It's, so we're going to give it from somebody else. We're going to take it from the rich. 
Well, the rich can't afford all of that. And who's going to pay the price? The middle class. And the, it will mean taxes will go up, and there will be a sclerotic uh, tightening of our economy. We don't want it. By the way, Jennifer did that story, and I want to say something about Jennifer. God bless her. Jennifer Wishon had a little baby yesterday. His name is Jackson, and we salute Jennifer, and we salute Jackson. Congratulations, and yeah. uh, happy motherhood. You've done a great <laughs> job. John? Congratulations, indeed. A time of multiplicity here in the newsroom. Oregon Governor Kate Brown announced the Trump administration will withdraw federal officers from Portland. The agent sent in to protect a federal courthouse under nightly attack by radical protesters. Local officials claim the presence of federal forces there is actually making the situation worse. Acting DHS Secretary Chad Wolf said local and state officers will now protect the courthouse. However, President Trump is sending a different message, saying the agents won't leave Portland until the city is secure. The president accusing Democratic leaders in several cities and states, Pat, of not standing up to violent protesters. Um, it's been suggested, and it may have some merit, why don't you just get out and let them have their problems? I mean, these are Democrat-controlled cities. The crime rate in New York City has gone crazy. The crime rate in Chicago has gone crazy. The Minneapolis-St. Paul situation is out of control, and Portland is out of control, Seattle's out of control. They're all run by Democrats. It might be the thing to do is just let them wallow in their problems, and uh, okay, then maybe the voters will, you know, we could even see a switch in New York, because the crime rate in New York has gone through the roof, and nobody is safe there any longer. And de Blasio wants to take a billion dollars out of the police budget and, and give it to some charity that his wife is in charge of. I mean, it, it's insanity what's going on. And the crime is, is if the president ever had a, a, a winning ticket, he can run on that. But the Democrats are saying, well, it's really the fault of the fact you've got federal marshals in here that's exacerbating the problem. It's not exacerbating anything. It's been going on long before they arrived. But the Democrat narrative is it's caused by the uh, presence of federal troops. Well, maybe take your hands off, Mr. President, and let them stew in their own juices. And we have a city in Virginia. Uh, I'm a Virginian. My family is Virginian. We've been in Virginia since the, about the time of Jamestown, a long time way back. But we have a, a city now that's known as Richmond, and uh, the city newspaper has begun to uh, question their government. John? That is right, Pat. The Richmond Times Dispatch calling leaders to account over violent protests over the weekend. Rioters did more than $100,000 in damage to buildings at Virginia Commonwealth University and set a city dump truck on fire. The Times Dispatch editorial claims police and the mayor should have acted sooner to put down the violence, writing, quote, the absence of leadership at all levels of government has compounded these circumstances. We've normalized too many behaviors that make Richmond and the United States a less safe and less prosperous place to be. End quote. Well, Tropical Storm Isaias is on track to hit Florida this weekend. The storm carrying 50 mile an hour sustained winds and bringing heavy rains and flooding to Puerto Rico. It is also expected to make landfall over the Dominica, Dominican Republic later today, bringing three to six inches of rain. The storm expected to reach Florida by Saturday and move up the East Coast later in the week, Pat, as if we don't already have enough to deal with. Well, that's what's going on. And again, hurricanes are a natural phenomenon that causes the heat in our planet to evaporate, and it's kind of a good thing, but those in the path of one of those things, it doesn't seem good at all. It tears everything up. That's so sure. be praying. Yes, we're hoping for a slow season. A slow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, a divine promise. How did it lead to this mother to defy multiple doctors and help save the life of her son? Also ahead, could we be on the cusp of a global revival? International speaker Jeremiah Johnson weighs in. That's coming up later on.
An ectopic pregnancy can be life-threatening. Here's the story. Jermaine Patterson woke his wife, Sabina, at midnight with these words, quote, God said you're pregnant, unquote. He also told the baby's name, Judah Emmanuel. Turns out, Jermaine was right. Sabina was pregnant. The only problem, her doctor said about this pregnancy, you will abort it or you could die. When starting her family, Sabina Patterson initially faced problems with infertility. But through IVF, she was able to become a mother to twins. In her late 40s, she longed to have another child. Doctors said her tubes were damaged and needed surgery to have them removed. But the night before the operation, her husband Jermaine said a few words that would change her story. My husband had a revelation. We prayed at 11.15 p.m. So 12 midnight, he jumped out from the bed. And I said, what, what's happening? He said, God said, you're pregnant. Um, he gave you a son named Judah Emmanuel. And when I get to the hospital, I let the doctors know that God said I'm pregnant. At the hospital, Sabina's pregnancy test results were positive, but doctors determined it was a false pregnancy. They saw a development on her fallopian tube and urged her to proceed with surgery to remove it. But Sabina remained confident in God's promise and refused the operation. I'm speaking to them. I said, you know, I'm pregnant and it's a baby. And they said, no, it's not a baby. So they want me to understand that it's not a baby, but I keep on refusing to say that word because people was doubting God. They make it seem that I'm crazy. God can use the foolish thing to confine the wise. So I tell God to prove yourself to them. So that was our prayer. Sabina couldn't find a medical professional who would agree to prenatal care. So at eight weeks, she went to a Christian clinic where she could have a sonogram. They find a fetus and fetus heart rate 158. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And Judah raised his hand in my stomach. So the doctors also captured it. And they said, the baby hands is up. And they said, congratulations, you're pregnant. It was determined that she had an ectopic pregnancy the fetus was developing on her left fallopian tube and her uterus was filled with fibroid tumors. Her condition posed serious risk to her child's life and her own, but the clinic was not equipped to treat her. At another office, she sought pro-life doctor John Brachowski for care. The baby couldn't get through the tube and it was behind the uterus. And so we said, you need, you need to go to the emergency room so we can take care of the condition you're in, which will happen to hurt and kill the baby. And um, she, at that moment, uh, her eyes lit up and she's like, no, Johnny, um, the Lord has told me that I'm gonna be healed and that everything will be okay. She sought several other medical opinions, but the doctor's response was always the same, abort the pregnancy or she could die. At home, the couple held on to God's promise. And I said, no, I'm not gonna kill the baby because it's a promise from God and I'm not gonna kill it. Six months into her pregnancy, her water broke and she was finally admitted to Johns Hopkins Hospital. Her placenta had invaded her liver and kidneys. Doctors said the baby could be delivered premature, but Sabina wasn't expected to survive. Sabina checked into the hospital and was scheduled to deliver in one month. I knew that I couldn't allow the doubt to set in, but I knew that I had to keep praying, keep, keep pushing, because I know God can do anything. On November 17, 2017, family and church members were prayerful as Sabina entered surgery. Two hours later, she gave birth to a baby boy, Judah. Sabina made a full recovery. We both, you know, we cried, and the mostly, as I said, it's our crying was thanking God. Just, we dance in the hospitals. We dance until we can't dance anymore because it's like, yes. Meanwhile, Judah was treated in the neonatal intensive care unit. When he was in the incubator, he raised his hand. And I said, thank you, Jesus, we made it. After three months in the NICU, Judah came home with his parents. 12 midnight, a day before Judah, you know, was supposed to be released, Judah himself disconnected the tubes. He pulled it out from his nose. He came home with no oxygen, no tubes. And since then, he hasn't returned back to the hospital. 
Every day I look at him, he's, he's a miracle, a miracle child. He's coming to do great things. At the heart, it's the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, the love of Sabina for Judah. And then thirdly, the expertise of the docs at Hopkins. And uh, for that, um, thank you, Jesus. Today, Sabina and Jermaine say their family is complete and they're thankful for a special promise that brought them Judah. Always have faith that God said it, believe it. Um, and just, just have confidence in Him, no matter what the situation looks like. It is miracle, and I believe that He's here for a reason. Romans talked about uh, the great patriarch, uh, Abraham, said being fully persuaded that what God had promised, He was also able to perform. That was a miracle. It just isn't supposed to happen. An ectopic pregnancy, uh, it will lead to the death of the mother and has to be aborted. No, no, no. God promised, and I'm going to stand on His promise. And lo and behold, there's a sweet little boy named Judah, I believe it is, yeah. isn't it? Judah. Mm -hmm. Judah great, Emmanuel. Great Judah Emmanuel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we got to pray great. for you right now. You know, God is not limited to one miracle. He can do as many miracles as is needed. So he's not restrained in any way. Here, here's some of the answers to prayer. Jocelyn, who lives in Cincinnati, Ohio, suffered from a terrible headache. While watching the 700 Club, she's heard Terry say, you have had random headaches throughout your life, but this one is different. It's like a band across the front of your forehead. God is healing that condition right now. Joshua said, I agree with you, and the headache completely disappeared. Wow, that's awesome. All right. That for her. This is Diana. She lives in Red Lion, Pennsylvania. She suffered from an agonizing earache for six months, and none of the treatments that she was given worked. While watching the 700 Club, Pat, she heard you declare complete healing for someone with a severe ear infection who was dealing with a great deal of pain. She believed. She placed her hand on her ear. She said the pain left immediately after six months. Wow. Listen, isn't God good? Yes. Now, now look, what he's done for those two, what he did for Sabrina, for others, he can do for you. He's not limited. He has miracles for everybody. He is an unlimited God. He's not limited. Now, Terry and I are going to pray for you wherever you are. And I'm just going to ask that as we pray, you agree with us. And whatever the problem is, stop doubting. Stop saying, well, it can't be for me. Yes, it can. So we'll join hands. We'll believe God. Father. I pray with my sister in Christ, and we agree together for those in this audience who are suffering and are having terrible pain. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon them now. May they know the blessing of God, and may your healing come upon them in Jesus' name. Somebody, you've had multiple births. I think it's like quadruplets. And you don't know quite to do how you're going to pay for it and all the rest. God is going to supply every bit. And so you can just praise him for the financial miracle. And those children will grow up into complete adulthood under the power of God. Terry? There's someone, you've had a, um, an injury with uh, horse riding. And it's your tailbone, your spine. Oh, it's really impacted your life. God is healing that for you right now, today, this moment. Lift up your hands and receive it. Just declare it and praise Him. Uh, there's a woman, you have incontinence, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, you just, it's just terrible. Your bladder, it just has no control whatsoever. Right now, God is strengthening those muscles, Jesus. strengthening that sphincter. You will no longer have that bladder problem. You are free in the name of Jesus. I believe the word Marcy, is that it? Okay, Terry, what else? Yes, someone else, you have discovered some lumps under your um, left armpit. God's healing that for you right now. They're just going to dissolve and be gone. You'll not even need to see a doctor. Thank you, Lord. Oh, man, you were hitting the head. I mean, it was really bad. You've had a concussion, and uh, you've had dizzy spells and you're afraid you have brain damage. Uh, Charles, I believe it's for you. And in the name of Jesus, receive an answer. Touch! 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Terry, one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's somebody else. You have a problem with the molars in your mouth. Just loose all the bone is a problem, everything. God is healing that for you, and he's going to provide the Thank method to, to free you from all of that and the payment for it as well. In Jesus' name, just rest in that. And Anxiety right now, be gone. may the anointing of the Lord touch you. You've cried out to the Lord. Let the Lord answer your prayer. Believe God and he will do a miracle in your life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Terry. Mm -hmm. Well, still ahead, a vision of two angels. One minister says he saw them in a dream. What were they doing? Jeremiah Johnson explains that's coming up. And then later, time for your questions and some honest answers. Scott says, I know that I've confessed my sin before God, but how do I forgive myself? Pat weighs in on that and more, so don't go away. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The United States is set to remove troops from Germany. The Pentagon today announcing the, the withdrawal of nearly 12,000 service members stationed there. Around 6,400 of those are set to head home to U.S. soil. Another 5,400 will be restationed in other locations around Europe. President Trump has talked about his desire to withdraw troops from Germany in the past, complaining that NATO allies aren't spending enough on defense. 25,000 U.S. troops will remain in the country. Well, Christian leaders from across the nation are gearing up for a virtual conference designed to inspire revival among America's men. The Promise Keepers Digital Global Gathering, July 31st through August 1st, will feature Pastor Tony Evans, Luis Palau, James Robison, and many more. And artists like Michael W. Smith and Phil Wickham will lead Christ-centered worship. The virtual event will take place this Friday and Saturday with the goal of empowering men to be a blessing to their families and their communities. You can find out how to register and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In December of last year, Jeremiah Johnson was speaking at a church conference. He was asked to share what he thought God was doing with the body of Christ at large. That night, Jeremiah says he saw two angels in a dream. Later, he found out that another speaker had seen them as well. Jeremiah Johnson is a best-selling author, ministry leader, and globally recognized prophet. He says while believers live in a world filled with moral decay, we cannot allow it to influence us. And rather than running from God's correction, we should run to it, because the Lord only chastises those He loves. In his book, Judgment on the House of God, Jeremiah says God's cleansing and glory will set the stage for the greatest outpouring the world has ever seen. Jeremiah Johnson joins us now via Skype. Welcome to the program. Well, as we mentioned earlier, you saw two angels in a dream during that conference. Tell us about that dream and what was going on. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You know, in that encounter, two angels appeared into my hotel room in the dream, an angel of cleansing and an angel of glory. And they told me that there was a boom that was going to come to the upper room, much like happened at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. There would be a boom that would come to the upper room, but the angel of cleansing actually had a broom in its right hand. And it said to me, before the boom comes, the broom must come. And I believe that broom represents the cleansing, the repentance, the purification. God is promising a historic outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe that we are on the precipice of a tremendous move of God, but God is welcoming the global church into a, an, a, a lifestyle of consecration, purity, and holiness. Jeremiah, you say God is performing a divine reset. What is it he's trying to accomplish here? 
I believe that even in the midst of COVID-19, God is releasing a divine reset. I believe God is waking up the church that we can no longer go through a business as usual mentality in the church. We have got to make more room for the Holy Spirit to move in our services and our gatherings. So this mm-hmm. divine reset, I believe there, it, the Lord said to me in the time of silence, which is this quarantine time in the time of silence, he's calling forth a remnant that will engage in spiritual violence. It's a mm-hmm. wholehearted abandonment to the Lord. You talk about the significance of understanding the holiness of God and having intimacy with him, that we have been focused on what we do for him, a a, a, a relationship with ministry this way, rather than connecting vertically with him first. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, in Ezekiel chapter 44, it says about the sons of Zadok, which I believe God is going to raise up a generation right now in the earth like them who prioritize ministry to God above ministry to people. And the sons of Zadok, they taught the people the difference between the holy and the profane. And so I believe in the global church, a divine reset, God is allowing us to shift our focus away from people and their needs oftentimes at the expense of the true worth and value, the intimacy that truly belongs only to Jesus. You also say that in our lack of or maybe unwillingness to sit under the holiness of God, the weightiness of that, that in fact we have allowed sin to creep in and accepted it as just part of life. Yes. You know, I believe that God is coming to clean his house this book, Judgment on the House of God, there really is a redemptive judgment that God is releasing. He chastises those that he loves. I believe in God's great love and his mercy right now on the earth. God is coming to deal with sin in his house. He's coming to deal with just even our desires to talk about his grace and mercy, but not repentance, not holiness. We're going to see a tremendous restoration of that reality in this generation. Sounds like it's going to be a separating of people because some will run toward the holiness of God and some will stay comfortably where they are. Is that how you see it? Yes, yes. I believe that we're in those times that Jesus spoke of, the separating of the wheat and the tares. You know, you can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares until they're harvested. And in this hour of harvest, when they're harvested, the wheat, it bends down and the tares stand straight up. Mm. And I believe that that speaks to the ability to be corrected, to be humble, to be submitted. As this holiness comes and it separates, God's looking for a people that are gonna bow down before him and worship him only. How should Christians be praying during these times, Jeremiah? I believe that we should be praying the prayer of David in the Psalms, search me and know me, O God, find any offensive way in me. You know, there's so much that we can talk about in the world, but God is dealing with the church right now. He's dealing with us. So let's look internally asking God to deal with any sin in our lives. And then as he works in us, he'll begin to work through us in greater ways than ever before. It's quite a book. It's a book calling out to God's people today. And I, I think you should read it. You can read more in Jeremiah's new book. It's called Cleansing and Glory Are Coming, But Judgment on the House of God. And it's available nationwide. Thank you, Jeremiah. It's a sober message, but a necessary one. Thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. Pat? Thanks, Terry. You know, folks, people are hungry. They're starving because of this uh, uh, economic crisis, uh, they don't have enough food. And if they can't work, you can't buy food. So you look at Felix, and Felix is a single father of three children. And the COVID-19 has hit his family especially hard. Why? Felix can't work. 
So Felix can't buy food. And the lunch program that he used to feed his children has been shut down. Before COVID came to the Philippines, 10-year-old Joshua was part of an Orphan's Promise daily feeding program in this mountain community. Joshua's dad, Felix, is a single parent. He had to travel every day to the city to work. What he earned wasn't enough to feed his three children. So Joshua has been helping out. He carried large sacks of charcoal from the mountain to sell in the market. I bought food for my brothers and sisters. That's how I spent the money I made from selling charcoal. It's really hard work, but I knew I had to help out. When COVID-19 hit, everything came to a stop. Felix was not allowed to travel to the city to work. All feeding programs, like the one supporting Joshua and his friends, were suspended by the government. It's been even harder for us now. Of course, I can't work. So we can't even buy food. Now we boil bananas just to get by and divide one meal portion into four. Because Joshua's family lives in a remote community, they're often the last to receive help from the government. I was losing hope. I just prayed and asked God to keep my kids from getting the virus. So Operation Blessing made the journey back to the mountain with help for Joshua and other families. Instead of group meals for the kids, we brought them food packs filled with rice, canned goods, milk, and other supplies. And we're planning to deliver more food in the weeks ahead. Thank you to the people who help Operation Blessing. And thank you for remembering us and for reaching us, even though we are so far away. I really thank God for you. Operation Blessing. I remember years and years ago, the Lord gave me the concept of Isaiah 58. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't give it to me. He gave it to Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote it down, and I read it in the 58th chapter. Isn't this the fast I chose that you would deal your bread to the hungry? If you see the homeless, you would bring them in. If you see the naked, you'd clothe them. And when you do that, all these blessings are going to come. And so we started something called Operation Blessing. And since that, it has helped millions and millions of people around the world. And Felix is just one of those that has been helped. And so now we're trying to feed people. We have a hunger strike force that takes, you know, we go take our trucks, go to the farms where they're throwing vegetables away, and we load up and then take them into the inner cities. We can help people. So if you want to participate, I would just ask you to consider the fact that you've got something good. And when you've got something good, if you don't share it with others, uh, the good will maybe be taken away from you. But as you share, it'll be more. You know, this he, he that withholds more than is off, it tends up to poverty. And those that scatter abroad, they get more and more. That's the way the Bible works. Now, if you want to join the 700 Club, and I hope you do, I want to give you something that's called Do You Need a Miracle? Real Life Stories of God at Work. This is a tremendous story, and it has blessed people all over. And it's how do you join the 700 Club? Just call and say, look, $20, $20 a month, 65 cents a day. You have a, a testimony. Well, I don't have a testimony, oh, but I've got some questions for you. All right. <laughs> okay. Pick up the phone, call in 1-800-700-7000. All right, Q&A, they're coming at us. This is Scott. He says, I've, I've had some problem with sin since I became a Christian. I know that I've confessed it, and I have a clear conscience before God, but how do I forgive myself? Well, you know, God says that he doesn't want you to be burdened down with sin, but he wants you to, be, to have a clear conscience that you might serve God. You see, God isn't interested in you beating yourself up on account of you're a sinner. He knows you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. And so the, that's, that's a given. So what he, what he wants you to be is to be freed from dead works that you might serve God. He wants you to be in God's service. So the question is, how do I forgive myself? Well, you just look and say, look, here's the word. How, how, the word says, I have been forgiven. Take God at his word. And that's how you forgive yourself. God forgave, if God forgave me, then why don't I forgive myself? It's just, trust God. That's it. Okay. 
This is Narki who says, how do you know when something is supposed to be a thorn in your life? And that thorn is the reason that God hasn't healed you after years of praying about it and even going to a church healing service. Um, I think you uh, put elided a couple of scriptures together that shouldn't be. Paul said, because of the abundance of the revelation was given to me, there's a thorn in the flesh that and I prayed to the Lord to take it away. And he said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Um, but the, you haven't been caught up into the third heaven. <laughs> and the apostle Paul was. He, he had extraordinary revolutions, uh, revelations of God. And uh, I, I think that's, that's what we're talking about. Go ahead. Okay. This is Gracie who says, is it a sin if I have a glass of wine at dinner? I've consumed alcohol a lot throughout my 20s and have felt convicted about it, so I stopped. Now I want to know if I should abstain from all alcohol completely or if it's okay if I have a drink once in a while. Um, look, uh, Jesus drank wine. He turned water into wine. Uh, the, the, the glass of wine, the Bible talks about it, it gladdens the heart of man. Um, the question is, again, Paul said, if meat causes my brother to sin, I'll eat no meat as long as the world stands. It's a question of what your influence. If you, you're taking one glass of wine, will cause an alcoholic to go off the deep end. You don't want to drink it. But as far as a sin goes in your life, having a glass of wine or a little beer or something like that is not some kind of a sin, unless you feel it is. Now, today's power minute is from 1 Peter. Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. See you. Next week, bye-bye.